We're so glad that you're joining us for worship in the 16th week of the season of Pentecost. Welcome to worship with Mount Olive Lutheran Church here in Santa Monica. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, now and forever. The fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth and light and our salvation. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse now the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown things we have done, and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you, and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you through power of the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
O oh God, rich in mercy, you look with compassion on the troubled world. Feed us with your grace and grant us the treasure that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning, friends. Come take a seat and join me for today's children's sermon. We are in the green season, the Sundays after Pentecost. When we think about how we grow in our love and faith in Jesus, let's listen to today's gospel story. The rich man stretched and wiped his mouth. What a delicious feast, he said. Grapes, lamb, and bread are my favorites. He brushed some crumbs off his expensive purple robes. Outside the rich man's gate, Lazarus sat on the dusty ground. I'm so hungry, he thought. I would even eat crumbs from the rich man's feast. But the rich man never shared. When Lazarus died, the angels carried him to Abraham. Lazarus was happy to be with his ancestor. When the rich man died, the angels did not carry him to Abraham. Instead, the rich man found himself in a dark place, alone and scared. Far away, the rich man could see Lazarus and Abraham. I am so thirsty, he shouted to them. I need water. Send Lazarus to bring me a drink. Abraham sighed. Child, in life you had a big feast and expensive robes. Lazarus had no food. You did not share with him, not even a crumb. Now you are far away. Lazarus can't share with you. I wish I had shared with Lazarus, the rich man sighed. He called out again, please, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to tell my five brothers about sharing. Abraham shook his head. Your brothers know God's rules. If they don't follow them now, they won't follow them ever. It won't matter who talks to them. So the rich man did not follow God's rules. He did not share love in the world. And he was separated from God's love. He was alone and scared in the dark. But we know that nothing will ever separate us from God's love because you have been washed in the waters of baptism, marked with the cross of Christ and God's grace is upon you. God's love is inside of you. And that love is for you to share in the world so that you can help the sick and the hungry and the scared. Let's say a prayer, friends. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we give you thanks for your love. We give you thanks that we have been washed in the waters, washed in Christ's death and resurrection and made new. Help us to share your love in the world with those who need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first lesson is written in the sixth chapter of Amos, beginning at the first verse. Alas for those who are at ease in Zion and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers will, shall pass away. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is written in the sixth chapter of First Timothy, beginning at the sixth verse. Of course, 
There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which we are called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. 
in Hades where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abram far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the faint tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and one cannot cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that, they may, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace, beloved, from God, our holy parent, and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our gospel lesson for this is the 16th week of this journey through the season of Pentecost focuses in on, I wouldn't say the relationship, except that there really is no real relationship here. No real relationship between this rich man in the parable and, and this poor suffering man in the parable called Lazarus. The name Lazarus is a Greek expression of a Hebrew name. In the Hebrew, name, the, in the Hebrew language, the name Elazar. Elazar. He whom God has helped, or the one whom God has helped. The one we call Lazarus. I believe one of the questions as we come into this, into our own relationship of wrestling with this text, will cause us to focus on maybe a question of whether or not we care enough about Lazarus. Do we care enough to wonder, wonder anything about him? I'm not asking if we could, or, or, or if we would speculate or draw conclusions about this man, Lazarus, and the circumstances of his life. I asked if we cared enough to wonder about him, cared enough to have some genuine interest, interest enough to hold, uh, interest enough to, to hold judgment at bay, interest enough that we would ask some questions or interest enough to probe the societal conditions that can result in even now in this 21st century experience of ours still result in one segment of society becoming and being rich beyond measure while another languishes covered with the evidence of mercy gone lacking and hungry for even the crumbs of what the selfish waste. This particular translation says that Lazarus lay at the rich man's gate. 
How did he get there? Do we care enough? Are we concerned enough even to wonder how this Lazarus comes to be at the rich man's gate? Another translation from the original Greek text says that at the rich man's gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. The implications here are that someone brought Lazarus there. Someone laid him there, laid him there in proximity to wealth, but with no relationship other than their common humanity. Bishop Nelson Child, I remember, would often say that one of the major struggles of our society and our times is that we ought to far too often live in proximity without relationship. Proximity, being close, close enough, but not with intent. A closeness that might as well be a thousand miles of distance. When my wife Judy and I first moved to Los Angeles from Columbus, Ohio, one morning after we had settled into the house and I, I was on my way to a meeting and I just turned off of Slauson Avenue. For those who may know Los Angeles uh, geography and I was driving north on Crenshaw Boulevard. And I had not gone far, maybe the distance from 59th Street up to about 48th. When I looked up and I realized, I realized I could see that famous Hollywood sign. From the Crenshaw District of Los Angeles, I could see in the distance the Hollywood sign. We had only been in Los Angeles for a few weeks, but I, but I already knew that for many living in near and in proximity to the intersection of Crenshaw and Slauson, the Hollywood hopes and dreams might as well be a million miles away. I don't take this text I don't believe that this text is to be some kind of wholesale condemnation of wealthy people. We need only refer back to our epistle lesson where the Apostle Paul reminds us that it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. The love of money. Money in and of itself is an inanimate entity that on its own can neither do good nor evil. Money stacked high on a table cannot move one inch on its own in the direction of helping nor toward harming. It takes human enterprise to determine what money and resource will do, how it will be used. The love of money that Paul talks about in his first letter to Timothy is not just an infatuation with riches. He's talking about obsession. Obsession to the point of worshiping wealth and making a god of our riches. Putting a higher price on possession than our value for people, their lives, their circumstances. In the gospel narrative, this Rich man, this rich person luxuriates every day and in proximity. Lazarus suffers every day. It strikes me that the gospel narrative would have us to, to picture the scene of, of Lazarus now because the text says that, the, that Lazarus died and was carried to the bosom of Abraham in the heights of heaven. Can we picture that? Lazarus lifted up to the heights of heaven and now in proximity, wonderfully close to our ancestor Abraham. And the rich man also died and was buried and now finds himself suffering in the unrelenting fires of Hades. But he looks up and he sees Father Abraham somehow and somehow, not only sees Father Abraham, but somehow now 
from this posture of, of where he is in the, in, the, in the grip of Hades, he recognizes Lazarus. Lazarus who suffered every day just outside the gates of a palatial dwelling that this rich man enjoyed. While he celebrated and while he luxuriated with sumptuous feasts and seemingly had no indication of knowing Lazarus, let alone wanting to know Lazarus, but now recognizes and calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy, send Lazarus, send Lazarus. Why? Why? Why sin Lazarus? Because I am in agony here. It, 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 is, it is interesting and it begs for us to pay attention to how it is that sometimes when we have everything that we need and we're living in the lap of luxury or certain levels of comfort or privilege, we can render those who are suffering, no matter how close, no matter how near, no matter what the proximity, we can render them almost invisible. But when the circumstances the tables are turned, if you will. There is a cry out. And even from that place of his own suffering, this rich man still has the audacity to ask that one who suffered at his gates, when he had power, when he had capacity to do something about Lazarus's condition, lived his life as if Lazarus was invisible, of no count, of no consequence. Lazarus, who would have rejoiced at the opportunity to, to benefit somehow from the, from the crumbs of the wealth that fell from the rich man's table. There are reports that tell us that during these times of this global pandemic, here in these United States, the collective wealth of multi-billionaires in the United States, living in this United States economy, the collective wealth of billionaires tripled. While the downward spiral of those living at or below the poverty level in these United States increased. The gospel text moves on to tell us that Abram's response, Abram's response to the rich man is child, remember. Remember that during your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things hurtful things, but he, he is now comforted here and you are in agony. Things have changed. Besides all this, the gospel narrative would have us to know that between where you are now and us, there is a great chasm. A great chasm has been fixed. I wondered about that great chasm. And certainly in, in our own economic strata, it's not as pronounced perhaps here in this United States as it is in the historical realities of, of say, a, a nation like India where there is a, a strict caste system. And the Dalit, formerly known and, and by, by some measure of, 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 of narrative as the untouchable, who could live out entire, their entire life 
in captivity of, of, of systems of bondage that would keep them not just limited in access to the resources of the higher caste of society, but also would render them into an almost inescapable cycle of poverty. And certainly we have similar dynamics here in these United States. I read one report that says on average it would take, if everything were to go right, it would take a person, an individual, and perhaps maybe that individual in relationship to their household, it would take them something like 20 years if everything goes right, if nothing goes wrong, it would take them probably about 20 years to work their way out of poverty. The chasm, there's a chasm fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so and one can not cross from there to us. Lazarus is now in a place of receiving comfort and experiencing mercy and the one who is rich, the tables have turned and still wants to exercise some level of authority, some kind of, of privilege to, to change things. If at least, let it be so. Send Lazarus as messenger to, to save my family, to warn my family to not live with the same philosophy of selfishness that I have. And again, the word comes as a no. Abraham replies, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. And the rich man again pleads for mercy. No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But again, Abraham's response, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophet, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Neither will they be convinced. What will it take, beloved? What will it really take for us to really believe that we are, as Martin Luther King would talk about it, we are bound in an inescapable garment of, of destiny. That what impacts one of us as a part of this family of humankind impacts all of us. And yes, there may be some temporary and momentary uh, insulation or isolation, one of us from the suffering of another of us. But until we come to recognize, until the eyes of our hearts are open, that we are, that we are by God's intent and by God's design, created with a kind and a spirit of oneness, that we are created with a manner of, of, of spiritual unity that, it, that binds us inextricably one to another. What will it take for us to recognize and realize that no matter where we find ourselves, on the rungs of the, of the ladder of, of human accomplishment and achievement and accumulation of stuff and things, what will it take it really calls us to recognize and realize that it is pleasing in the sight of God that we love one another, that we care for one another, that we wonder about the conditions and the circumstances that render some to what seems to be inescapable suffering. What will it take? By the grace of God, we live. By the grace of God, we are changed. By the grace of God, we are saved. God be with you. Baptized in water.
Beloved, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was convinced or conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. For our prayers of intercession, after each prayer petition, I will say, God of grace, and then we will all say together, hear our prayer. As scattered grains of wheat are gathered together into one bread, so let us gather our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of God's good creation. O oh God, rich in mercy, Fill your church with righteousness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Empower the baptized by your spirit, be rich in good works and ready to share. God of grace, hear our prayer. Protect the earth and its creatures. Provide water, food, shelter, and favorable habitats especially for endangered species. Preserved threatened ice caps, glaciers, parks, and beaches. God of grace, hear our prayer. Increase justice in nations, local governments, and courtrooms. Guide lawyers and those who hold public office to act with compassion and discernment. God of grace, hear our prayer. Give food to the hungry. Set the captives free. Lift up those who are bowed down. Watch over the stranger. Tend to those who are ill, especially with those we name silently or aloud. Stir us to act in the best interests of our neighbors. God of grace, hear our prayer. Enliven our praise, inspire musicians, artists, poets, and all who create beauty in this place. God of grace, hear our prayer. Sustainer and giver of life, you bless this congregation with abundance. Instruct us in the proper and faithful use of wealth and resources that we share generously. Guide the work of church councils and committees and give them clarity for the work of ministry in this place. We especially pray for ministries of administration, leadership, and finances in this interim season for the preschool ministry and for the ministries of being caring partners with those who are sick those who are experiencing food insecurity and those who are houseless god of grace hear our prayer enfold the saints who have died in the arms of your loving care grant that the holy angels accompany us and bring us to eternal life with them in the light of your presence. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gathered together in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, we offer these and all our prayers to you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us, let us offer our thanksgiving for the word. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things new. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into me. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you call your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness forgiveness through the cross, life to those enthroned by death, the way of your self-giving love. And for your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O oh God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of the world in need. Faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the poor. Thanks be to God. Greetings, Mount Olive. I'm working my way through the subsections of one of the Magnificats written by Jean-Francois Dandrieu. And today's subsection is called Flutes. And as it suggests, it calls for the stops on the organ that are sometimes called flutes, flutes or sound like flutes. And uh, sometimes they're made of wood, <coughs> uh, but also can be made of metal. And we have different kinds of flutes or flute stops on the organ here at Mount Olive. And I'll just play a, a few of those. You can see they have a much sweeter sound. One, some can be a, a little more full. And then uh, this one in particular, on one of our quieter divisions of the organ. So actually for this movement, I'm going to use that quiet flute stop, what's called the roar flute on our choir division, which is behind some of the shades. So this is flutes from one of the Magnificats by Jean-Francois 